No matter how good your bullpen is, when a season is 162 games long, it's never going to be perfect. And the Orioles have a great bullpen, but it faltered a bit in Thursday's loss to the Angels. I'll recap all the bullpen moves and the loss to Anaheim coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, May 19th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 6-5 to loss to the Angels on Thursday as they end up splitting The four-game series, despite having a lead late in the game, O's bullpen just could not get it done this time. I'll give you the five things you need to know from this one, including Adley Rutschman's big home run, the existence of Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, and Tyler Wells having a really, really interesting start. Plus, I'll break down even further about the Orioles' bullpen moves on Thursday, why Brandon Hyde made the moves he made, and why it's a lot more intricate than you think managing a bullpen over a 162-game season. And finally, talk about a couple of Orioles minor league roster moves before previewing the weekend series against the Blue Jays. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. And when you enter promo code locked on MLB, they'll throw in a free custom bird dog style Yeti tumbler with every order. So we'll kick things off today with, unfortunately, an Orioles loss. Angels 6 and Orioles 5 is the final score from Oriole Park at Camden Yards on Thursday afternoon, a little 12.30 matinee on getaway day as the O's end up splitting the four-game series at home against the Angels. Not a terrible split. I mean, you got an Angels team that, you know, right now is, I would say, a winning ball club. I mean, they're 23 and 22. O's dropped to 28 and 16 with the loss to the Angels, but you would have liked three out of four. I figured a good series for the O's would be they lose the opener when Shohei Otani pitches, and then they win the next three. They got two out of four. It's not terrible. You'd like to get three out of four at home, but two big series coming up after this, which we'll get to a little bit later. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 6-5 to loss to the Angels on Thursday. And the first thing you need to know is Adley Rutschman, despite it, not ending up being the game-winning hit, hit a huge home run in this game. Came up with a runner on first and one out in the bottom of the seventh with the Orioles trailing four to three. And Rutschman unloads on a fastball in the inside part of the plate. He just turns on it and hits a rocket out to right field. It would have been his second homer on to Utah Street this year, but it actually hit right on top of one of the pillars out there at the back of the flag court and bounced back in. If it would have been anywhere to the left or the right, it would have cleared the gate and ended up on Utah Street, so kind of unlucky. But in spirit, it was a Utah Street hit. 108.2 off the bat, 424 feet. It was an absolute bomb. He watched it. The swing was beautiful, and it gave the Orioles a 5-4 to four lead in the bottom of the 7th. Unfortunately, they didn't hold that lead, as we'll talk about, but Rutschman just continues to be the heart and soul both on and off the field of this team, and it's just a pleasure to watch him play every single day. Second thing you need to know from this one is that Adley Rutschman hit in the two hole. He had that home run. He had a couple of walks as well, but it was really the number nine hole and the number one spot in the Orioles lineup that was definitely getting the job done. O's had five runs on 10 hits. Now, they did struggle once again with runners in scoring position in this game, but Austin Hayes, out of the first spot, did all he could. Three for four with a double in this game. And then Joey Ortiz got the start in the nine hole, playing second base. He went two for two. Now, it was a couple of bloop singles the other way, but they all count the same. But neither of these guys, despite the good starts, actually finished this game. Adam Frazier came in as a pinch hitter for Ortiz in seventh with a right-hander coming to the hill, and Frazier flew out, but then he did have a single in the ninth inning. Unfortunately for the Orioles and for Frazier, he tried to stretch it into a double and was thrown out for the second out of the inning, which was not great. And then in that same ninth inning, Austin Hayes was due up with two outs and nobody on, and the Orioles trailing six to five. And they go to Cedric Mullins as a pinch hitter in the number one spot. 
He ends up hitting a ground rule double. Rutschman is intentionally walked. And unfortunately, Ryan Mountcastle strikes out with the tying run at second and the winning run at first with two outs to end the game. But the nine and one spots combined in this game for the Orioles went uh, eight for 10. I would call that uh, pretty good, I would say, or seven for nine, excuse me. Still pretty good from those two spots and uh, productive spots for the O's on Thursday. Third thing you know from this one is that Quite simply, the Angels still have Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. And even when Otani's not pitching, the two of them impact the game in a big way. And it's hard to pitch around it. They've got a little bit of protection this year. Not as much as they've had sometimes in the past. It's just tough, right? Shohei Otani starts the scoring with a home run in the first inning off of Tyler Wells to make it a one nothing game. Then Mike Trout ropes a two-run shot over Mount Baltimore in the third inning to put the Angels up 3-0. Now the O's did fight back from that, but Trout and Otani combined for a four for nine with two homers. They each had two home runs in this series. It's just so tough to face them two and three in the Angels lineup. It really is tough. And and the O's made the comeback after each of them homered in the first three innings. The O's had the big fifth inning capped off by a monster two-run homer from Anthony Santander that tied the game at three. In that fifth inning, hit a moonshot over the wall in left field. 107 off the bat, traveled 418 feet. But the O's just didn't have enough to overcome Trout and Otani in the end because it was Otani who got the game-winning hit, the bases loaded two-out infield single in the top of the eighth that put the Angels up 6-5, to five, a batter after Mike Trout was hit by a pitch to load the bases. Just tough to pitch around those guys, tough to get them out, and that certainly showed in the four games in this series. But back to the O's side, the fourth thing you need to know from this one is that it was a very, very interesting start for Tyler Wells. One of the most intriguing starts he's probably ever had in his young big league career. Wells went five innings, allowing three runs on six hits. He struck out seven. He walked one. He allowed the two homers I mentioned, one to Otani and one to Trout. And it took him 95 pitches to get through five innings. So he left after five. Now a 294 ERA on the season, gave up eight hard hit balls. But I really want to break down this start a little bit further from Tyler Wells, because when we've seen the good Tyler Wells, like take, for example, his last start over the weekend against the Pirates, seven scoreless innings against Pittsburgh on Saturday night. He struck out guys, right? He had, you know, a good amount of strikeouts, but he also a lot of his other outs. He keeps the pitch count down. He gets a lot of outs in the first three pitches of any at bat, and that's what allows him to pitch deeper and deeper into games. Well, that was not the case on Thursday. I think Tyler Wells, I believe he got in the most three ball counts that he's had all year in any start. And he was really relying on his fastball. 44 of his 95 pitches with a four seam fastball. He didn't throw anything else more than 17 times in this start. So you look at that from Wells and you say, you know, he only walked one guy, which is typical Tyler Wells. You know, he doesn't walk barely anybody. But if you just watch the game, I thought he had some of the worst command, like pinpoint command wise of the season. He was kind of erratic, a lot of three ball counts, pitched his way out of it, but was getting behind hitters more than I've really ever seen from Tyler Wells as a starter. But the weird part was he missed more bats than he ever has. A career high 19 whiffs on 48 swings for Tyler Wells. That is a 40% whiff rate overall. The fastball was good, got seven of them there. The changeup was incredible. Five whiffs on 10 swings. The slider got three whiffs. The cutter got three whiffs. He only threw five curveballs and got a whiff on one of them as well. It was just a swing and miss party. And to get 19 whiffs in just five innings is really, really impressive. Like that's up there with some of the biggest strikeout pitchers in the game. That's, you know, near the amount of whiffs they'll get in a five inning stint. And that's what happened for Tyler Wells. His stuff was pretty similar to what it usually is. Spin rates right there. Velocity's right there from what we see. A little more four-seam fastball than usual. But the cutter was working. The changeup was working. It was so interesting to watch because, again, Wells has been getting more strikeouts this year than he did last year. But overall, over the last two years, when he's been at his best, it's that he's efficient with the pitch count, attacks guys early in counts, and the strikeouts will come. But generally, he gets those lazy fly balls on like the second pitch of the at-bat. That's when Wells is at his best. He wasn't really that at all on Thursday, and maybe it did hurt the O's a little bit. I think they expect more than five from Tyler Wells at this point, and he only gave him five innings. But it's interesting to see the seven strikeouts and the 19 whiffs and just thinking ahead, like 
What can that become for Tyler Wells? If he can combine the two versions of himself, the super efficient version and the swing and miss version into one pitcher, the O's could have a, a different ace on their hands and his name could be Tyler Wells. But the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 6-5 to five loss to the Angels is that some of this was on Wells for only going five innings, but the bullpen just uh, did not get it done for the O's today. The Orioles' bullpen, in its four innings of work, end up allowing three runs in this game, allowing the Angels to come back, score two in the eighth, and win it 6-5. to five. Between Mike Bauman, CNL Perez, Brian Baker, Austin Voth, and Danny Coulomb, they allowed three runs in this game on seven hits they combined to walk three batters. Now, they did strike out six, which is still good in four innings of work. But most of that was Danny Coulomb, who all four outs he recorded at the end of the game were strikeouts. So you'll take that. However, just an off day for the bullpen. And it happens, right? You have a top five bullpen in baseball. They're pitching a lot. A little less recently, but still pitching a lot. You know, you have Yinier Cano. He's not available, so you don't have your best guy. Things just happen sometimes. It's a 162-game season. It'll happen from time to time. You don't have your best stuff out of the bullpen. But I wanted to dive into that specifically coming up next because these just happen, right? 162 games, you're relying a lot on a good bullpen. They won't have their best day sometimes. And a lot of people want Brandon Hyde to manage every game like it's a playoff game, like it's Game 7 of the World Series. And you can't do that because by the end of June, if you do that, You'll run your team into the ground. So coming up next, wanted to kind of break down all the bullpen decisions that were made by Brandon Hyde and the Orioles on Thursday. And whether I agree with them or not, and I'll kind of let you know which ones I do, I'll give you the reasoning for each one and why managing a bullpen is not a day-to-day -day task. It is a weekly, monthly, yearly task. You got to think about a thousand things at once. And I'll try to break some of those down coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by So Rare. So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace, transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. But unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, So Rare managers truly own their fantasy experience. You buy, sell, and compete with player cards, and win or lose, you still own the cards, and there's no cost to play. And there's even game weeks every week, and if you rank at the top of the leaderboards, you can win scarcity cards, you can win game tickets, merchandise, signed jerseys, and even VIP experiences like meeting MLB stars. So head to SoRare.com slash LockedOn. That's spelled S-O-R-A-R-E dot com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's so rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. So the Orioles fall to the Angels six to five on Thursday afternoon. They end up splitting the four game series, two games apiece against LA. And still, it was not a bad homestand for the Orioles by any stretch of the imagination. You win a series against the Rays, you win a series against the Pirates, and you split with the Angels. I'll take a 6 and 4 10 game home stand really anytime, especially when you've already built yourself the cushion they did in April. But of course, one of the big reasons the O's did not win Thursday, one of them was because they had really good chances early in the game and didn't convert with runners in scoring position. And another one is because the bullpen just kind of had an off day. As I mentioned, bullpen had to cover four innings, they end up giving up three runs and the Orioles lose the game 6 to 5 with the big two run inning in the 8th for the Angels being the difference. Now, there was a lot of comments, a lot of questions, a lot of vitriol towards Brandon Hyde and his bullpen decisions on Thursday. And before I get into each one specifically, I just want to say, like, you can't manage every game like a playoff game. I know fans want to. I know fans think that's what you should do and think that's what you can do. But when you have 162 games in a season, and I know for some of you, I'm preaching to the choir, but for others, it's important to understand this. You can't manage every game like a playoff game. You have to think about the next game, two games down the road, two games ago, the next week, who's coming back on the IL, you know, who, what they did last year in terms of workload and how that goes into this year, you know, who's throwing in the bullpen versus who had to throw and then sit back down, who threw in the bullpen yesterday, how long they're waiting in the bullpen to come in, the pitch counts, do they come in for a second inning, you know, the matchups coming up, the pinch hitters that could be used, the three batter minimum. All that different stuff. You know, who warms up the fastest? Who's more comfortable in certain situations, in certain innings? 
There are so many things that go into bullpen decisions. And it's not just Brandon Hyde making the calls. He gets advice from Sig Dell and his team before and after every game. They go over the decisions. But in the moment, it's still on Brandon Hyde. And there's a lot to go through at one time. So we'll start with the big one. Why was Yenier Cano not used in a one-run game? He was not available. That's a pretty simple one, right? He pitched Tuesday night, closed out the game in the ninth inning in a 7-3 to win. He then pitched Wednesday night, pitched a pretty good eighth inning to keep the game at 3-1. to one. They're not going to use pretty much anybody at this point three straight days. So Cano was down. He was unavailable. Now, I saw some comments. Why was Yenier Cano used on Tuesday night in a four-run game in the ninth? Well, first of all, that is the most annoying hindsight managing take of all time. You're going to go back two games ago for a pitcher who threw a scoreless inning, and that's going to be what you blame the Orioles losing this game on? Come on. The reason why he was used in that game is, A, the Orioles didn't want to use Felix Bautista there. All right, he's been pitching a lot this year. You grab a four-run lead, you think, all right, not a safe situation. And you can argue that the Orioles shouldn't just use Felix in safe situations. They should use him at high leverage. I'm totally on board with that, but I'll get to that in a minute. Why using Cano? Well, he also hadn't appeared since Saturday. So he didn't pitch Sunday. He didn't pitch Monday. It's a delicate balancing act for relievers. You want to give them rest when you can, but you also don't want them to rest for too long because then they get rusty. So it was, it's kind of a perfect time to get a guy two days off and then get him back in there. It's still a high leverage spot. I know it's a four run game at seven to three, but it's still the ninth inning. You're still trying to lock down a win. And when you know Yenier Cano hasn't given up a run all year, you can send him out there. He's rested and you're confident, right? You're confident he's going to deliver three more outs, get you the win. That's exactly what he did. The Orioles win the game seven to three. I have no problem with Cano pitching in that spot. And you ask, well, why wasn't it Felix then? If he's the ninth inning guy, why don't go to Felix? Well, if Felix would have pitched Tuesday, then Felix would have pitched also Wednesday, and then he would have been the one not available on Thursday. So they still probably wouldn't have used Cano in the eighth inning because Hyde maybe potentially, because Cano still would have pitched the day before on Wednesday, probably saves him for the ninth inning, and we're still in this same spot. And if you want to go back less than a week, you're thinking, oh, why did they you know, not use Cano or Bautista? Why didn't they use Mike Bauman or Austin Voth or you know, CNL Perez or, or Danny Coulomb or whomever in the ninth inning of a four-run game Tuesday. Well, if you think back less than a week, what the Orioles did on Friday night, they led six to two. They had a three-run eighth inning against the Pirates to go up six to two as Cedric Mullins completed the cycle. Hyde sits down. Bautista says, we got the four-run lead. Let's give you another night off. You've pitched a lot. Let's get Austin Voth in there. What does he do? Walk, walk, single, all of a sudden it's six to three runners on first and third, no outs. It's a disaster. And Hyde still has to go to Bautista who comes in, gets three K's and locks the door. But that's the risk you take when you're not going to your number one, a guys in the ninth inning. So I don't blame Hyde for just wanting to shut things down Tuesday when they weren't able to do it on Friday. So that's the reasoning on Yenir Cano. Now, Hyde also had to use a lot of guys in this game, right? Like that's one of the big issues here is that Tyler Wells, who's been consistently going six plus innings, only went five innings in this game because the pitch count got up. And Mike Bauman couldn't even finish the sixth. He gave up a couple of hits and allowed the go-ahead run. CNL Perez ended up coming in, throwing an inning. And then the other issue was Brian Baker was once again, not sharp. Only two thirds of an inning and, and the two runs get charged to him. He walks two batters again. Like he's been a little concerning here. So that's another issue. You don't have the lockdown Brian Baker you had when he had those 14 straight scoreless appearances a couple of weeks ago. So that's another issue here. You know, you've already used Bauman Perez Baker. You're running out of high leverage guys. So the next question and the comment I saw a lot was, okay, why not go with Felix Bautista in the eighth inning there? If you're saying, oh, Trout and Otani are going to come up, that's what they did. Trout was hit by a pitch to load the bases. Otani gets the infield single to put the Angels ahead. Why are you not going to Felix for the eighth inning? Well, Brandon Hyde has been pretty clear. He wants to use Felix almost exclusively in the ninth inning. Now, you can have your gripes about that, and I'd be on board with that too. He should probably be in the high leverage spots. But when you have Yinye Cano, he can be your high leverage guy, and I'm okay with Felix being the ninth inning guy at this point. That's what we know the roles are for the Orioles. And what we really do know is that, hey, Felix has gotten a few four-out saves this year. He did it multiple times last year. He's already done it a couple of times this year. So the other question was, well, why didn't Felix get a chance for a four-out save? Well, 
Felix pitched on Wednesday night. Hyde is never going to go to Felix unless it's September or beyond for a four plus out save on a back to back. So when he pitches the night before, he's not going to have more than three outs to get. So that was the reason why he didn't come into the eighth. Now, the other question is, well, why didn't you just use Felix for the eighth and then somebody else for the ninth? Because Trout and Otani were coming up in the eighth. Well, if you remember, Trout and Otani weren't supposed to be coming up in the eighth. After the Adley Rutschman homer in the bottom of the seventh, the Orioles led five to four going into the top of the eighth inning, and it was six, seven, eight due up in the order. It was Thice, it was Renhifo, and it was Zach Neto. And then it would have been nine, one, two, which would have included, of course, Gio Urshela, but then Mickey Moniak, Mike Trout, and then eventually Shohei Otani. So if you're Brandon Hyde, you're thinking, okay, let's try and get Brian Baker through the eighth. Then we use Bautista in the ninth when, if all goes well, Trout and Otani would be hitting. So actually, his thinking was, let's give Bautista the highest leverage outs. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way because although Baker started the eighth inning with a strikeout, he allowed two base runners after that, a hit and a walk. And so then you're in a tough spot. So the other question I got was, okay, Austin Voth came into the game. Why Voth and why not Felix in that spot? Because you're getting closer and closer to, at that point, facing Otani and facing Trout. And I get it. Gio Urshela was up and you had Taylor Ward on deck and then Trout in the hole. Well, if you think about it there, the big thing you need to know is, I think Hyde thought Brian Baker could get through that inning. And when it was clear he wasn't going to, you got to get somebody up fast, get him warmed up, and get him in the game. It takes Felix Bautista a little while to get warm. Austin Voth is, I think, the guy who warms up the fastest in the Orioles bullpen. We learned this in the game I mentioned last Friday night when he came in in the ninth inning. Felix was warming and ready to go in that Friday night game. O's were leading 3-2 to two in the bottom of the eighth. Felix was warming. Then Mullins hits that three-run homer with two outs. Makes it 6-2, to two, no longer a safe situation. Bautista sits down, but there's two outs. So if somebody else is going to pitch, they got to warm up quick. And Hyde went to Voth, I think, because he's the guy who warms up the quickest in the pen. So Voth, who hadn't pitched in a couple of days, he was certainly rested and available and had been pitching better as of late. That's the guy you go to because he warms up the quickest and there's righties coming up and his breaking stuff plays well against righties. So that's why he went to him and not Felix, who takes a while. And that's why I didn't go to Danny Coulomb in that spot, because there were, what, three straight righties coming up. You don't want Coulomb coming in to face three straight righties as a left-hander. So they go to Voth, and it doesn't exactly work. He gives up the game-time RBI single. Then he gets the strikeout, but then he hits Mike Trout to load the bases. They do go to Coulomb. He gets the ground ball he needs. And I know people were mad at Danny Coulomb for not being able to cover, cover first, on the infield single by Otani that gave the Angels a 6-5 lead. Here's the thing. Danny Coulomb is a left-hander who falls off the mound to the right side, to the third base side on every delivery, pretty aggressively falls to that side. Those are the pitchers where it is the toughest to get to first base. And when you're falling that hard to that side, and Shohei Otani, a left-handed hitter who runs that well, is getting up the line, it is close to impossible to get to first base. Now, he could have sprinted over a little quicker and made it at least a play, but Ryan Mountcastle, who made a great diving play, said after the game that, you know, hey, he looked up and nobody was there, but he said, you know, Danny falls off the mound to the third base side, Otani's so fast, it was almost an impossible play. And that's really what happened there, which gave the Angels the lead. Now, Coulomb did a nice job, gets a strikeout, gets a scoreless top of the ninth, and the Orioles still don't use Felix, but that's kind of all your reasoning there for the Orioles' bullpen. Like, Things, they just happen. It's a 162-game season. Sometimes all your best guys aren't available. You can't manage every game like a playoff game. You're going to run them into the ground. Maybe could he have done some things different? Maybe Hyde could have done things differently, and maybe the O's would have won this game. But generally, you just have to use all eight guys in your bullpen. And that's what he did. He had to do it on Thursday. He used a lot of guys and just didn't work out. It doesn't work out every time, no matter how good your bullpen is. And that's really the overarching point here for what happened in the bullpen and the Orioles do lose the game 
and split the series. But one more quick thing to get to here on the pod before we get out of here. Orioles acquired a couple of minor league players on Thursday. Now, you're saying minor league players, this team's good at the major league level. Why do we need to hear about that? Well, one of them won't make an impact. But the other one kind of became a hero at the World Baseball Classic this season. So maybe he could finally get himself to the big leagues with the Orioles. We'll talk about who those two players are and get you ready for the weekend coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Bird Dogs. What are Bird Dogs? The most comfortable, the best fitting, and the most versatile shorts known to man. Now they got pants too, but I haven't tried on the pants. I can only imagine the pants are the same as the shorts, but I have two pairs of the shorts. Now they have a great fit, right? You can get three different lengths. You can get different sizes. They contour to a lot of bodies and they fit well. I look, I, I look good, feeling good wearing the Bird Dogs. The comfort, though, might be the best thing. They got the stretchy fabric that just feels good, but they still look good, right? So they got the stretchy fabric that feels like an athletic short when you're wearing them. They've got the liner in them as well that gives you the freedom to just wear that one pair of shorts wherever you're going. But they also, you can kind of play them off as a nicer pair of shorts. You can wear them in a lot of different scenarios. So just go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB, get your shorts, and when you enter code Locked On MLB, they'll also throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Again, that is birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Enter the promo code Locked On MLB. Get the amazing comfortable shorts, get the tumbler, and be happy with your new Bird Dogs. So as the Orioles bullpen faltered a bit and they lost 6-5 to five to the Angels on Thursday to split a four-game series, they did make a couple of minor league moves kind of under the radar during Thursday's game. Now, the first one was super, super minor. It was Tim Susnana signed to a minor league deal. He's a 27-year-old catcher, formerly with the Arizona and Cubs organizations. Hasn't played since 2021 because of some injuries, but he's healthy now. Hit 241 in the Cubs system in double A in 2021. He's just catching depth in double A. Always have a couple of catching injuries. He's just a depth signing at this point. But the other minor leaguer that they acquired is a little more interesting as the O's made a minor league trade with the Kansas City Royals on Thursday, acquiring the 27 year old infielder Robbie Glendenning from the Kansas City Royals for cash considerations. Now, Glenn Denning does not need to be on the 40-man roster because he wasn't with the Royals. The O's just acquired him as a minor leaguer, and they have sent him to AAA Norfolk. Now, that is interesting because Glenn Denning was in AA with the Royals the last two years. He's never played a AAA game, so when he appears for Norfolk for the first time, it'll be his first AAA game. Now, you may be wondering, why did Norfolk get another infielder? Don't they have enough with Jordan Westberg and Connor Norby and Joey Ortiz sometimes and Lewin Diaz and Josh Lester and others. Well, it's always nice to have depth there, especially when guys like Vavra and Ortiz and soon probably Westberg are going up and down between the majors and the minors. It's nice to have somebody who's just there all the time and is not necessarily a top prospect, more like a guy who's just going to be there, provide you a steady presence. But I think he's a little more than that. Now, who is Robbie Glendening? 27-year-old right-handed hitter who has played around the diamond in his last couple of years has played mostly first and third base this season, but played a lot of second base and shortstop last year in double a for the Royals and actually came up as a shortstop throughout the system. After he was a 21st round pick by the pirates out of Missouri in 2017. So he's moved more to a corner defensively at this point, but had been a shortstop for most of his career. Now in double a so far this season, 26 games and 110 plate appearances. It's not offensive numbers that'll light the world on fire. Glenn Denning hitting 242, 373 on base, 363 slugging, only got two homers, but he does have a 16% walk rate, which is one of the highest in double-A baseball, although it does go with a 25% strikeout rate, that's pretty high. He's got a 105 WRC+, plus, 5% better than a league average double-A hitter, so not anything amazing. Now, he flashed more power last year. He had 19 homers at the double-A level last year with a 112 WRC+, plus, but he's always been a high walk guy, always had really high walk rates but he's cut his strikeout rate by 10% this year, which is really interesting for the Orioles because he's already making those swing decisions. But you might be wondering, Connor, they acquired a 27-year-old to put him in AAA for depth. Why are you talking this much about him? Well, it's because you might remember the name, Robbie Glendenning, if you watched the 2023 World Baseball Classic because he became really the star of Team Australia 
this year. In Team Australia's five games of the WBC, Glenn Denning went six for 20. That's a nice little 300 average. Two homers, six RBIs, six Ks, three walks, and a stolen base. But those two homers were massive, including quite possibly the biggest home run in Australian baseball history. It came in the group stage with two on and two outs in the seventh inning, and Australia trailing the highly favored South Korean team 4-2. to two. Glenn Denning mashes a three-run homer to left field to put Australia up 5-4 to four in a game that would go on to win the huge upset that allowed Australia to advance into the knockout stage of the WBC. He became a cult hero for Australian fans, for baseball fans who watched the WBC. I know he has two homers in double A this year, but he had sneaky pop in the WBC, got a great batter's eye, cutting the strikeouts, versatile defensively. You never know. Robbie Glenn Denning maybe rides the momentum of the WBC, maybe right into the big leagues with the Orioles at some point this year. But in terms of the guys who are currently at the big league level for the Orioles and are Currently trying to keep this O's team on pace is one of the best teams in baseball record wise. They've got a huge series coming up this weekend. Orioles and Blue Jays in Toronto. The Jays certainly had an interesting week against the Yankees. Now it's the first matchup between Baltimore and Toronto this year and a huge interdivision matchup. Blue Jays coming in at 25 and 18 on the season. Game one is tonight, 7.07 start. Kyle Gibson goes for the Orioles. And Yusei Kikuchi, the left-hander, goes for Toronto, who is having a bounce-back year. He has been so, so much better this season. The 31-year-old lefty had a really bad 2022, but he's got a 3.89 ERA in eight starts this season. Although his last start was really weird against Atlanta. Four innings, seven Ks, no walks, but four runs on nine hits. O's hoping they can hit him like the Braves did. Now, this game is on Apple TV+. Plus. I believe it's still free to everyone. If you're subscribed there, you can definitely watch it. But look out for more info on how to watch tonight's game. Again, it is on Apple TV+. Plus. Saturday day game is at 3.07. Grayson Rodriguez goes for the Orioles, looking for a bounce-back start. And Alec Manoa, the righty, goes for the Blue Jays. Now, he's been their ace the last couple of years. He's been the opposite of Kikuchi this year. Manoa has been terrible this season. Nine starts and a 5.40 ERA. He just cannot figure it out. His last start against the Yankees was an absolute disaster. Four innings, five runs on six hits. He struck out three, and he walked seven batters in four innings of that start. Then the final game is on Sunday, a 1.37 p.m. Eastern time start. Dean Kramer goes for the Orioles, and our old friend Kevin Gosman. Pitching for the Blue Jays, having another nice season at 32 years old. Gosman with a 3-2-7 ERA, 77 strikeouts in 55 innings over nine starts this year. He's been dominant. Last start against the Yankees was just amazing. Seven innings, two runs, five hits, 10 Ks to just two walks. It'll be a tough one for the O's Sunday, so hopefully they can take advantage on Friday and Saturday. And then I'll be back with you on Monday, recapping all the action from Probably the biggest series to date for the Orioles. O's and Blue Jays in Toronto. I'll have the recap of the weekend when I'm back with you on Monday. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.